Okay, my name is uh, Judith Bartels from Germany. And uh, I've got a background in publishing houses. So I've been an editor and uh, just last year changed to the university to work with OER. So when I saw this thematic C uh, session about friends of foe, publishing houses versus OER, I was like, yeah, that's something I can talk about. And so here, my opinion, OER and publishing houses actually complement each other. So that's based on our German educational system. So here we have uh, that um, in Germany the education is regulated by states. So it's a federal system. And this means we have 16 different curricula. And uh, that's kind of hard to make than a fitting school book. So uh, in theory there are then up to 16 different school books need for each subject each year. And this makes it kind of hard. And, um, but we have a pretty accessible uh, system, education system, regarding money. And um, because schools and university are financed by the government, and uh, therefore school material is provided by the schools itself funded by the, by the government. And universities have large libraries, so they can, uh, students can uh, borrow the books they need. And uh, actually, educational costs can be returned through tax refunds. But unfortunately, it's barely used because no one knows about it, and it's, about, it's a lot of bureaucracy to do that. And of course, there's financial aid through student loans uh, from the government. And that means money is a minimal drive for OER in Germany. That makes it a bit different than in the US, actually. So what about school books? So what, what is the purpose and requirements for them? Um, actually, books, uh, school books in Germany, one part of it is that they guide um, the teachers through changing curricula. Uh, most of the times, uh, uh, with each change in government, the curricula changes and new, new curricula come and teachers think, how do I do that? And the school books guide them through them, how to teach them by that. And uh, as I said, it's barely possible to make one book uh, fitting all curricula. That would be that thick and uh, you can't tell students to carry that to school. And um, so we need um, different school books for different German states and that means publishing houses have this resource to do that. And they meet this need actually. And on the other hand, we have the small materials, educational materials that is also required for teaching. And there's worksheets, videos, small units, photos. And they, they, they meet a different need for teachers. Uh, because every teacher has their own teaching style and uh, they want to, to use that flexible and adaptable in their, um, in, in their classroom. And this is a need OER can meet perfectly in their huge variety and their possibility to adaptation. So that means they have all their respective strengths, OER and the publishing houses. So publishing houses on the one hand, they have the school books and print, they have resources in form of money and experts, and a huge effectiveness due to their existing infrastructure in authors, editors, print, typesetters. I mean, a school book production is at least one to, th to three years, and that's just for one book and oh, an editor working 20, like a full-time job for it. And um, then we have the professional quality assurance and trust from, uh, from teachers in the quality. On the other hand, OER, with his, uh, its bottom-up and from teachers to teachers and small dynamic material, mostly digital, and high diversity and rapid adaptation. And of course, it's fulfilling the five R's in that it's, you can reuse it, retain, re revise, remix, and redistribute. And uh, so if you take money out of uh, the equation, you, the, they actually have their own unique selling points that do not overlap but complement. 
So the idea is open educational resources and publishing houses have both their right to exist and their respective strengths and um, are complementing. But of course, we, we don't live in a perfect world. So right now, uh, there is a lot of fear of losing the means of existence. And, and there, is a, there are a lot of prejudices beholding us um, of co collaborating here. So, but how could it work? There are some stories. So there's, for example, open access and publishing houses working together, like the Springer Publishing House. And they, they do publish scientific publications under Creative Commons license, uh, additional to their normal uh, publications. But there is a fee, an article processing charge, which in Germany they have the deal agreement, um, which um, uh, means that they publish only, um, they pay only what they publish. And there is no subscription fee anymore, and the university pays, pay, are paying it, and not the authors themselves. And it includes an access to online articles. And, uh, but this fee doesn't apply for low-income countries. And there's an advantage for higher, uh, as a, it is a higher visibility and greater impact. Another uh, nice example is, uh, um, I really like the Norwegian digital learning arena, and uh, I see there are some colleagues from Norway sitting there, love, love this project. And um, they make state-funded OER for upper secondary education vocational studies, and uh, digital material online tools, and uh, with the philosophy, what is best for learning versus uh, it's not what they want, uh, they want to do what's best for learning and not best for business. And uh, the money is coming uh, from 20% of what was recently used for school book, and, um, but only 20% of it. And uh, this money is now used to buy OER. And, uh, but still, printed books are still widely used, and that means there is a low impact actually on, on publishing houses, but still the publishing houses resent, most of the, the big publishing houses resent it and don't want to work together with them. And uh, they only work together with small publishing houses, startups, where they buy their OER. But I get, uh, in my opinion, there's a huge uh, um, possibility there. Uh, so in summary, um, Publishing houses have their USP in school books. So OER, uh, it's hard to find the resource and infrastructure for this time-consuming big book production that is especially needed, um, as I did, said in the example of Germany, with 16 different states and books needed. And, uh, and they have publishing houses have their reputation and quality. On the other hand, OER, they have their USP in the small material, adaptable, and, uh, and then the places where the publishing houses can't make the money, say, um, where they can't make big profits. And uh, so they take the small markets, they, they go where, where publishing houses can't go, are flexible, diverse, and um, uh, helping and teaching. Um, but there is still lots of fear and resentment, but in my opinion, the cooperation can be really beneficial. So let's overcome prejudices and start collaborating. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Judith. Um, Thought-provoking, I think that uh, the publishers and the open community is often set at polarized spaces. And I'm, I'm interested to hear some questions from the audience. So please, if you have a question, raise your hand at the back, Sarah. Oh, can I, can I just yell and everyone can hear me? Yes, please. Um, I think the, the first question is at the back there. Can we just do that one first, please, if you don't mind? Thank you. We'll come to you in Norway. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much um, for that really interesting talk. Um, so, uh, I'm an academic librarian and focus a lot on uh, looking at transformative agreements and reinvestment of 
um, money in um, different open access publishing models and whatnot. And part of what you were talking about with um, looking at investing, shifting away from investment in traditional publishing models to uh, open access titles or, or other open titles, where do you see the, the fiscal responsibility for this sitting in an institution? Um, do you see that as you know, university libraries paying for this to subsidize? Do you see it being subsidized by um, you know, student fees? Do you see it as being paid for by the university? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, in my opinion, uh, as it is in, uh, in Germany, education is a, is a state thing, so it should stay there and that the state finances it actually and so through the university the states finance the universities and the universities then distribute the money further and use it for OER. I, I think that lady was I think let's just do the, the, the questions in order of how the hands were raised, please. So um, our colleagues from Norway, please. Thank you. Hello, I'm Margreta uh, from Norwegian Digital Learning Arena. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I was just thinking about when you were talking about how we see in Norway, and I think it's also a movement across the globe, but shifting towards more student-centered and more problem-based learning. And in Norway, we have research that shows that when this happens, uh, teachers also shift from being very reliant on a book uh, and kind of following the course of the book through the year and starting much more to design their own learning assignments uh, for their students. And then they want to pick and mix learning resources from different places to fit just their needs at that time. So, so I think it could be possible uh, uh, for the publishers to, to kind of move with this. Um, and of course, the book, we see that the book is one of the sources that the teachers would like to use in this context. But uh, as we see uh, things moving, we also see plans for ecosystems where the publishers would, would have to kind of take their digital resources and you could pay for just one bit of it and not buy the whole. So that is one movement, but the other one is closing everything into one big digital universe that you had to pay to get into and you will never get out of it again. So there's, there's very much happening at this time, so I don't know if, if you see that in, in Germany as well. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, actually that's uh, unfortunately the thing that publishing houses in Germany do, the big ones. They, they do make some OER, but they're closing it off, and uh, so you have to pay a f total fee. And um, and uh, in my opinion, there's a lot of innovation missing. So um, the innovation is coming more from the OER side, making it new digital, and publishing houses are actually struggling to make it new, to think new. They're pretty conservative in their structures and their thinking, which prevents them from stepping also in the future, which is actually creating those, this fear of missing out, because they are losing their ground because they're not evolving with the digitalization, with the new ways of teaching. And uh, I, I really love school books. I, I'm coming from there. And uh, I think they make a great foundation for teaching, but they are not everything. Definitely not. And uh, also, books can change in the way they are presented. There are also ways of digi using digital books. And uh, so, uh, also with uh, making new financial models, uh, um, unfortunately, publishing houses are not really creative. Thank you. Um, just for now, I think that we need to move on to our third speaker. So we'll have some time possibly at the end of the session. But uh, can we have a round of applause for Judith Barton? <laughs>